Hi campers, this is Darren with My RV Works. Today we're in Port Ludlow, Washington, and we have a service entrance panel that's starting to meld. Now, what I wanna do is I wanna show you a close up of what we're looking at, and then I wanna pull back and, and try to explain what's going on with this thing. Okay, so for our video today, we are in very close quarters, um, so I'm not able to get a, a whole lot of uh, wide shots, but you'll look here, this is the neutral bus bar, and I think it doesn't take much to see that the neutrals are all melted, okay? Now, when you look over here, the blacks, if you will, are not melted at all. The breakers are not warm, okay? But the neutral, obviously, is melted. So I wanted to show you that. Now, also on the ground, there you go. They show that they may have gotten a little warm in there as well. So what I want to do, let's pull back. Let's do a little bit of show and tell. I'll set you up on the tripod and... Uh, try to help get your head wrapped around what's going on here, but I'll be referencing all of this, okay? Okay, so I wanted to come outside where I have a little bit more room because I really want to spend a few minutes explaining why would the neutral melt? The hot wire's not melting. It's the neutral wire that's melting. And isn't neutral supposed to be the, just the neutral wire? I mean, it's harmless. What's causing the neutral wire to melt? Um, now I've seen this many times in RVs and it's always the neutral wire that we see having the problem. I've seen the neutral wire on shore cords. I've seen it in service entrances, the receptacles, automatic transfer switches. It seems to always be the neutral wire. So what's up with the neutral wire? Why is a neutral wire melting? Why isn't the, 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 the hot wire, the black wire? So let's start with talking about the differences between the black wire and the white wire. What are they? Um, we're going to talk about alternating current, AC. Now in an RV, there are three separate electrical circuits, if you will, totally dedicated separate from each other circuits. Um, whether you have a class A or a, cla or a travel trailer or something, you're going to have that, that chassis wiring. That's the one that's going to make your blinkers turn, your brake lights and all that kind of stuff. Okay. We're not talking about that one, but that is a DC circuit direct current. The second circuit that you have is your house circuit. That's your lighting, um, your control modules that are in your, your water heater, can brain. Um, uh, that's the 12 volt house side. We're not gonna be talking about that one either because that is also a DC circuit. But the OEM chassis circuit and the house circuit are both 12 volts direct current coming from the battery, okay? But they are separate. The only thing they have in common is the chassis ground. What we're gonna be discussing today is AC circuit. So we're gonna talk about the difference between AC and DC. I'll give you an analogy. When you've ever ridden your bicycle and you're pedaling your bicycle, okay, and you're, 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 you've got your power stroke when you push down on that pedal and then the other leg kind of comes up, okay, and just visualize that with me as you're pedaling, okay? Well, which stroke is the most important one? Ah, it's a tricky question. You might think that the power stroke is the most important one, but if this, the other leg's not coming back up the other side, then you're never gonna get it ready again. So that is what I want you to think of on the AC circuit. It's, 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 it's a balance, it's up and down. So AC is like a bicycle pedaling, okay? DC is like skydiving. There is no up, it's all go time, it's all down, okay? So DC is, is pushing, AC is alternating. <clears throat> So have you ever played the game Hot Potato? Okay, so Hot Potato, we've all played it when we were in, in you know, youth group or whatever, and visualize this with me. You, you've got a line of kids, make a big circle or whatever, we've played it different ways, and there's a potato and it's hot, and we're gonna go this way, we're gonna grab that potato, and I'm gonna, I need a prop here. Uh, I have a rock, okay, so here's my electron, here's my potato, and I'm gonna grab the potato from this side, and I'm gonna pass it, to my partner and I'm gonna go back empty, picking it up again. I got a potato, go back empty. I got a potato, go back empty. I got a potato, go back empty. That's AC. I've got an electron that's got an excited charge in it. I'm going this way and I'm gonna come back empty. So I'm the black wire, I'm the white wire. I'm the black wire, I'm the white wire. I'm the black wire, I'm the white wire. <laughs> Two, three, four, get some exercise, do some twisting. So, let me just go, go, go one more step with this because I, I, I'm, I'm going to take a few minutes and explain electricity and then we're going to get into why the neutral is melting. So if you need to, you can jump ahead uh, and jump over all this if you already understand electricity. But I'm going to take some time to do this because if you can understand what I'm talking about, then it's going to be very simple why the neutral wire is melting. 
Okay, so all these little foundational steps that I'm building, it's like I'm going to teach you arithmetic before I teach you how to use a calculator. Yeah, weird analogy, but stay with me on this. So when the hot potato, when I have the potato in my hand, I'm the black wire carrying an excited electron to go do work. The work is done, and I'm going to come back on the empty white wire to go get another electron. The question is, if I'm a manufacturer and I'm going to make a motor, and you're a manufacturer and you're going to make a motor, and my son over here, Dakota, is a manufacturer and he's going to make a motor, we need to have a standard on how many how many potatoes, how many electrons we're going to get. Okay, so I don't know when the year was, but they just the Hertz. I'm going to Hertz here. Um, decided that 60 hertz in the United States and 50 hertz over in Europe was the standard rate that we're going to give potatoes at. Okay, so think of me passing 60, in, we're in the States here, we're in Washington, so I'm going to say 60 potatoes a second. Okay, so I'm going to pass 60 potatoes a second, so that's the pace that I'm going to be delivering these potatoes on my black wire. You know, 60 hertz, okay, um, 60 potatoes going by me, okay. Um, so now we have a standard with how fast the potatoes need to go to my motor that I made, your motor that you made, my son's motor that he made. So when we make motors or light bulbs or toasters or whatever, we're making them to a standard with how many potatoes we're going to get per second. Got it? So now we've talked about Hertz. We've talked about the difference between the, the purpose of the white wire and the black wire. The black wire is the one that's carrying the electron that's excited and has a charge. And the white wire is the one carrying the electron back that's been used up. So let's talk about these electrons for a second. Think of eighth grade science class. I think that's when I learned about this. Mr. Cabaretta, yay. We were talking about the electron and we were talking about the orbitals of an electron, okay? We we're talking valence shells and things like that. So where's my rock? Okay, <clears throat> stay with me on this. This is the way it makes sense to me. So I'm gonna, I'm gonna paint in broad strokes here. So here's my electron. Let's call this copper, it's a copper electron. Copper is a great conductor, that's why we use it in all of our wiring in our houses. So this is a copper electron. So we got it out of the ground or whatever. Okay, so what we need to do is we need to excite this electron. This electron is going to be the one that's going to turn on our toaster, light our light bulb, run our motor, do whatever. So we're going to excite this electron and these electrons, these copper electrons, these orbitals are going around like there. We're going to excite it so they're up here now. Okay, so it's the same element, but now we've excited it. So the electrons are, are out in a little bit outer orbital. Okay. And we're going to pass this through and all this thing wants to do is do its work and get back to the state of entropy where it's relaxed. So we have excited this electron. This electron has the potential to do work, work being do something, a light bulb, a toaster, whatever. And we're going to send it down the line. And when it does its work, it uses up those outer shells and it reduces itself back down to where it's just a piece of simple copper that we might see sitting on the ground. It won't hurt you. Um, so we excite it. It does work, it uses it up, it goes back. Okay, so far so good. Um, an electron can really do, this excited electron can really do only one of two things. The first thing it can do is it can resist a load, and the other thing it could do is it can induce a load. Resistance versus induction. Think of a motor, okay? Uh, we'll talk about uh, induction first. So this electron's traveling through my wire, it's excited, it's going to go somewhere, and it's going to induce something. Uh, when you think of induction, think of magnetism. So think of a motor, you got your armature and your stator, and they turn inside, there's no moving parts between the armature and the stator. But inside those windings of that motor, I'm going to create a magnetic field, it's called electromotive flux, and I'm going to create a, a magnetic field that's going to induce it to move. Okay, so it's the same thing that you see on your traffic lights with those little those little rings in the ground. When you pull up to a traffic light, that's an induction loop. It's going to see that that steel body of your vehicle, and it's going to induce the electrons and excite them. It's not going to touch them though. Um, so we're talking about um, the electron being induced. It's going to induce a load. So that's one thing that an electron can do is induce a load, um, create magnetism, make a motor turn. Okay, so it can induce. The second thing an electron can do is resist. So as my electron's going through my wire, it can either induce something, think of a motor, magnetism, getting something to turn, or it can resist something. Think of your incandescent light bulb. Uh, it glows that filament. That filament is glowing because my electrons are, are resisting. Okay, think of a toaster, think of a hair dryer. Okay, any form of heat. Okay, so I'm either inducing or resisting. 
that's important because we're going to learn about why that matters when we're going to talk about our melting um, neutral wire. Okay, You see a lot more melting neutrals when you have a resistance load than when you have an induction load. Okay, Resistance is, I'm, I'm, I'm trying to push you, I'm pushing you, I'm pushing you, I'm pushing you, and you're resisting me, you're pushing back. And that's what's happening inside of our wire, whether it's a, a toaster, a heater, um, um, th these types of things. So my electron's pushing through the wire and it's being, it's being resistance. That's why it's called resistance. So real quick review, make sure my head's making sense because I'm throwing a lot at you. And again, the goal is to explain why the neutral wire is melting. So hot potato, black wire, white wire, black wire, white wire. The electron it's passing by is passing by at 60 times a second. It's might be more than that, but that's the concept of why is it 60 hertz because there's a standard. Uh, we could talk screws. I can make screws and Dakota can make screws and my customer here can make screws. And we decide that I'm going to make screws that I, I want to do a 1020 thread and he wants to do an, an 1113 thread. What's that? There's no standard to the threads. So we need to have a standard. So 60 hertz is our standard. So we're passing electrons, right? Um, We've talked about uh, uh, induction versus resistance, okay? So I have you about where I want you now, okay? I've explained some background. Now let's go into what's causing, why would the neutral get hot and not the black one, okay? That's where I want to go next, now that I've laid all this foundation, okay? There's two more fun little, little things I want to share with you. Uh, the first thing is this electron traveling through a wire, it's only going to travel on the outer perimeter of that conductor okay so if i have a solid piece of copper wire and let's say it's this big around the electrons are only going to be traveling on the outside it's not traveling through the center of the wire it's only on the outside of the wire um, so when you think of like welding cable finely stranded wire very flexible there's a lot of outer edges to all those strands so um just, just a little piece of trivia there. This uh, the electron doesn't travel through the conductor; it just travels on the outside of the conductor. The other thing I wanted to share with you was when you take your meter and we put it into our, uh, when we do a test, we're going to get like let's just use the example of 120 volts. Okay, so what's that all about? When I read my 120, what is 120? Um, let me. Let me, let me go there because sometimes people get confused on voltage versus amperage. So let me explain voltage versus amperage since we're, if you're watching this video and you're, you've hung with me this far, I think there's a little bit more that I can explain, like a little offer to add value to your understanding of electricity. So just hang with me a little longer, I promise we'll get back to the melting neutral. Like I said, if you already know this, just jump ahead and we'll, we'll get into the melting neutral. But um, like I said, if you've hung with me this far, that means you're interested in electricity and there's a lot that I could share here. So let's just keep going on this. So two points on, on the, the 120 volts. <clears throat> when I take my meter and I touch it from the black wire to the white wire and I look at my meter and it says 120 volts, okay? Think of the ocean because the waves, I'm trying to do this, this waves because AC travels as a sine wave. And when you think of the wave, so I'm gonna drop a, a wave. I'm gonna go up here to the top of the wave and then down to the bottom of the wave and then back up again. If 120 is what I'm getting on my meter, then the top of the, I'm just keep using simple math here, okay? So the top of my wave is 240, okay? And the bottom of my wave is zero, 240 to zero. The 120 is the average between the two peaks, the peak and the trough, 120 is the average. That's why when you get a meter and it says true RMS, that RMS is the one that's doing the average between the two, okay? Um, so. I just wanted to share that. Another thing, if I needed to check the air pressure on my tire, I'm going to take my tire gauge and I'm going to, you know, check it. And let's say my truck gets uh, 65 psi. Okay, that's that's pressure. So I can say 65 psi is the amount of pressure pushing against the walls of my tire. And all of a sudden, I throw the word voltage at you and you freak out. You're like, oh my god, I don't know what voltage is. Voltage is is so so if psi is is in my, if 65 PSI is in my truck tire, and I, I tell you I have 120 volts in that wire, there's a direct correlation between that. Think of volts as grains in a bullet or um, open lanes in a checkout lane, okay? Um, things, uh, it has to do with the potential to do work, unless it's lanes in a cashier line. Okay, that's a silly joke. Um, 
So if I'm checking air pressure, and I need to know how much air pressure is in my tire, the tire is spec'd at 65, I use an air pressure gauge and I get 65 PSI. If I want to run, I'll, use, I'll stick with the toaster analogy. So if my toaster needs 120 volts as a standard, then that is the pressure in that wire, the electron pressure in that wire. If PSI is air pressure in my tire, 120 is electron pressure in my wire. Does that help at all? So when I see voltage, I'm looking at in pressure. Think of it as pressure. Um, the, how, how, how hard I can push something in there. It does not necessarily mean volt flow of, okay? A lot of times when people are using uh, electrical analogies, they'll use water, okay? So I'll stick with this water analogy because a lot of people do use water analogies when you're using electricity. So let's stay with water. From here on, I'm gonna explain water and talk about voltage and amperage. Voltage and amperage, okay? If I have my garden hose, and the, the, the let's say I have a garden hose that's connected to my house, and I'm gonna go over here and I'm gonna put an end on it where I'm gonna be able to turn it off at the end of my hose. And I'm gonna, I have a way to measure how much pressure is, how much water pressure is pushing against my hose, okay? The water's not moving through the hose, it's just got pressure pushing against the hose. That's voltage in a wire. Water pressure pushing against my hose is voltage pressure in a wire. Water pressure is voltage pressure. And I just use the air pressure analogy in the truck. I could use a bullet and talk about grain in a bullet. It does not mean the bullet's going down range. It just means that it's got the potential to do something. How much something? Well, how much water pressure do I have? How much air pressure do I have? How much grain in my bullet do I have? Um, uh, okay, so voltage is pressure. If I open up my garden hose and I let the air, I let the water flow through to turn on a sprinkler or something like that, then now I have water moving in my hose. The water moving in my hose, you can reference it as gallons per minute, for example. Okay, uh, feet per mile, whatever. There's 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 movement going on, and we can measure that. Um, so gallons per minute is my hose analogy gallons per minute of water through my hose is amperage in my wire. Gallons per minute is amperage. Pressure against my hose is voltage. Okay, So when I am uh, using my meter, I first want to find out how much pressure is on this wire. Okay, uh, you'll see me in my videos check out different things I'm using. I need to, I'm expecting to see 12 in an RV. We're going to look for 12 volts or 120 volts. So I expect to see 12 volts on this wire. I expect to have 12 volts of pressure on my hose. Okay, uh, if my battery is dead, then I don't have as much pressure on my hose in my wire. Okay, um, maybe my battery is dying and now all of a sudden my, my pressure is reduced. Um, I have 9 volts DC and that's not enough pressure to do the work I need to do to run that sprinkler that is spec'd to run at 11 to 13 gallons per minute or, or voltage. Or, or uh, Stay with me. No, uh, um, I hope you brought some popcorn because this is going a lot longer than I thought. So amperage is flow of electrons. Voltage is the pressure in the wire. Okay, now let me stop right there and talk about what's making the neutral wire melt. <laughs> okay, now that we've done all this crazy stuff. Okay, let's do that next. So now that I've just spent the last, I don't know, 20, 30 <laughs> minutes talking about electricity, some of the foundations of electricity, uh, let, let's, let's actually talk about what the topic of this video is about and why is my neutral melting, okay? Um, I have no idea. I am stumped. I have a clue. I don't know. I have no idea. <laughs> gotcha. Okay. <laughs> okay. That was my, my humor attempt. So when I think of a melted neutral, there's really only two things that come to mind why a neutral wire would melt. Why any wire would melt. Actually, okay, three. 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 I just came up with a third one. Um... The first go-to reaction that a lot of people are going to say, and they are very accurate in this, is that there was a loose connection. The wire going into the neutral bus bar was not tightened all the way, okay? So it is true that a loose neutral on your bus bar could very easily cause heat, okay? 
that's the first thing. And we're going to go into the second thing. But let me just stay with this heat thing for a second. <clears throat> An electron traveling through a wire will not generate any heat. The electron generates heat when it's confronted with resistance. Okay, Resistance could be a loose connection. Resistance could be the dirty prongs on your shore cord. Resistance could be a wire gauge that's too small. Okay, Anything that is going to cause that electron to slow down is resistance, and that is going to cause heat. So your homework assignment should always be, as you're camping in your RV, to walk by and feel that shore cord. See if that's warm or if it's hot. If it is, there's resistance there on your shore cord. Um, some people, it's time to break camp. They'll drag them through the dirt and they'll just stow them and then they open camp the next day and they are, the next time they go camping, they plug it in, their prongs are dirty or go look at your prongs and I'll bet your prongs are oxidized and dirty. Um, look, at the, look at if there's any melting going on in there. If there's, if there's evidence of melting, the damage is already done inside the cord body, okay? But maybe you're doing everything perfectly right. You, you, you take toothpaste and you clean your prongs and your shore cord is perfect. What was the last guy like? when he plugged his cord in. So when you're plugging into the, the campground's pedestal, what's that receptacle like? Uh, we've done jobs, I've got pictures, uh, because it turned into a big stink of who's responsible for the damage that was done. Uh, was the park responsible or was a camper responsible? The park was obviously responsible because I took pictures of inside the receptacle and those prongs were dirty and melted and you can see that the, the plug at the campground was all melted also. It's not your fault, it's whoever was there before you. One of the things we're gonna be doing on this video is we're gonna be going over here to the pedestal and we're looking at the pedestal. We're gonna to get to that in a minute. So the first thing that would cause a neutral to melt is resistance, is heat, or well, is resistance. Loose connection, okay? The second thing, and, and we see that mostly, we mostly see a loose connection as the problem. Um, when I've done these receptacle jobs, and I did one about two weeks ago. Um, the customer has lost all power to the back of his coach and we tracked it down and he had one of these uh, self-contained receptacle bodies and when we took it apart to see the problem, the wire was, was melted. You can see how the, the, the neutral wire was melted and on those self-contained receptacle bodies they have, um, you, you lay your wire inside and it usually gets caught by two vampire style connectors uh, when the OEM built this RV, they cut the white wire too short and it was only grabbing one of the two, okay? Um, so loose connection, an improper connection. That's the first thing. The second thing is the wire is just simply too small. For some reason, uh, you've got a, um, um, a wire that's, that's, got amp that's got the amperage flowing through it, but it's just physically too small. Uh, here is, it's not so much a trick question, it's a go, no, go question. What's the purpose of a breaker? What's the purpose of a fuse? There is only one correct answer to this question. The purpose of a fuse, the purpose of a breaker is to protect the wire, period. That's it. You say, well, no, no, I need to, I have, I have all these lights and I have my shop saw here and I have all this. Well, that's great. That's all downstream. The purpose of a breaker is to protect the fuse. <laughs> the purpose of a breaker is to protect the wire. So you have a 15 gauge breaker, that's a 14 gauge wire. You have a 20 gauge break, a 20 amp breaker, that's a 12 gauge wire. Um, on all your fuses, uh, you look at how do you know what size uh, fuse to put in? Well, you look at your wire gauge. That that's that that is the correct answer. Um, if it's engineered correctly, the engineers that designed all this would have made sure that the wire gauge is correct for whatever the work that's being done. So if the toaster requires so many watts to make toast. Therefore, I need a wire that's, rate that, that's this size gauge. Therefore, I need a fuse that's going to protect that wire. Okay, So the wire is what's used to determine the wattage, the, the amount of flow going through it to do the job. The fuse's job is to protect the wire. What causes a house to burn down? Wire caught on fire. Breakers and fuses should protect wires. The first thing was a loose connection. The second thing is a wire gauge too small. The third thing is a little bit more dicey. It's a little bit more tricky, harder to prove, but I'm going to show you a trick. That is where you have a situation. We see now this coach here is a 30 amp coach. Um, I see this more on 50 amp coaches where you have the, 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 the I'm going to call it the black circuit and the red circuit, L1, L2, A, B, whichever one, pick, pick a, a nomenclature on how you want to name this stuff. I'm going to call it the red and the black. It's just easy. This will be red. This will be black. Okay. 
they the red and the black share a common neutral okay if the red and the black stay with me on this because this is this is what what I want you to be looking for is that the um, let, let's say the red is pulling 50 amps and the black is pulling 50 amps and there's a neutral the, the, the voltage actually goes down on the white wire I don't want to go there if you want shoot me a text message or, or comment there and we'll go into why the neutral goes lower in voltage when these go higher it has to do with that bicycle analogy but if you're sharing a common neutral and you have a load going out and it is using one neutral it is very possible for that neutral to become overloaded we see that mostly in the 50 amp coaches um, here's how you test for that so you need a clamp on meter that's going to read the AC amperage going through the wire okay so you have your Romex wire most people just clamp the black wire and they're going to clamp the black wire and they're going to determine how many amps are flowing through that wire so here's what I want you to do to find out if um, if it's a, a hot neutral or if it's a, a situation where you're you have a shared neutral between two circuits turn everything on in your coach everything just turn it on turn, turn everything on go look in your service panel there's a Romex wire and it's got three wires in it it's gonna have the black the white and the ground okay um, so what I need you to do is you need to clamp around the black wire and read how many amps are going through the black wire Let's just say in my analogy, I have 10 amps going through my black wire. Then I want you to clamp around the white wire. You should also have 10 because that's returning. Okay. If you have a number that's different between these two, then the white wire is carrying an unbalanced load and it's generating heat. Does that make sense? And we're going to do that when we're done with this job. We're going to put it, we're going to take that whole panel out. We're going to put a brand new panel back in. And we're going to be low, turning everything on in his RV, all the AC circuits that we possibly can. And we're going to clamp around the black wire. We're going to clamp around the white wire. And we're going to see if they're the same. They should be the same. Okay. Um, if they're not, then, then my question is, if I'm sending 10 out of the black, I expect to get a reading of 10 coming back to me. If I get anything other than 10, where's it coming from? It didn't come from the black. The neutral's picking up something someplace else. We talk about hot skin tests on RVs. Um, so there's something strange going on if there's a difference between the white and the black. Okay, So three things that would cause a neutral melting, the most common and the one I would go to first is a loose connection somewhere or a dirty connection or basically resistance in that connection. Whether it's dirty prongs, dirty receptacle, loose connection on his bus bar. The second thing is a wire is too small. We talked about the purpose of a fuse and a breaker. The wire might be too small. Um, the third thing is the neutral is being shared by two circuits, okay? And the way you test for that is you take your meter and you clamp it on the both, the black and the white, okay? What I want to do now is um, I've gone through tremendous detail on electricity. Uh, trying to, I've tried to do it in broad strokes, not get into the nitty gritty. If you're an electrician, I'm sure you're going to be like, Darren, you didn't talk about this and that's not correct. That, okay. <laughs> um, so I, do, I love comments, so make comments down below if the analogy helped or if the analogy didn't help or if I've totally confused you or if I'm just totally wrong on some of my analogies. Um, uh, so yay on that. And what I want to do now is it's very tight quarters on the inside, but what we're going to do is we're going to take out that old panel, the one that's melted. I just decided it's a warranty has honored this. So uh, the customer signed off on this as well. We're going to take that whole panel out we have a brand new panel to put in. All those Romex wires that are melted, we need to cut those back and go back into the wall, put a junction box, and make new Romex wires that are going to be longer to fit back into the panel. Whenever you, in an RV, whenever you bond an AC circuit, it needs to be inside of a junction box with a cover. You can't just put a wire nut on it and call it done. It has to be inside of a junction box with a cover. So we're going to have to do that on this job here. And um, I want to show you inside of his, his uh, pedestal, that's the next thing we're going to go look at, actually. We're going to go look at this pedestal to see what that pedestal looks like. Because if there's melting on the neutral in here, there may be melting in the pedestal as well. And the pedestal problem could have been what caused this whole thing to begin with. Uh, so we're going to go take the pedestal apart, look at that. We talked to the campground operator here. The campground operator has given us the thumb up on doing that as well. Uh, if you're going to ever open up a pedestal, get permission. Um, there's a lot of dangerous voltage inside of those things, so get permission to do it. And uh, Don't just randomly go around and start taking covers off pedestals. 
okay? And when we're done, we're gonna disconnect the RV and then we're gonna go inside and start slicing and dicing. So stay with us on this journey and we make this repair. Hope this is helpful for you. Okay, now the first thing I've done here <clears throat> is, let me make sure you can get that in focus. So I've unplugged his um, short cord. And if you look right here, this is the white wire. See how there's a little bit of corrosion? Now there's not showing that there's a lot of, let's see which way is the lens. There's not showing that there's melting going on, but there is some oxidation going on, okay? And you can see that, that this customer has actually cleaned his prongs. You can see how he's been cleaning them. We're, when we're done, we're gonna clean them ourselves and gotten the oxidation off. Now the next thing I'm gonna do is let's go look at the receptacle itself that's on this pedestal here for site 25 here, okay? So let's go look at that next. Okay, so here is the um, the pedestal, and what we do sometimes is we look, I can't get it to focus, but we look inside of there with a flashlight, and uh, we look for melting. But what I'm going to be doing is I'm going to be taking this cover off um, and looking at the wires inside. So we've got the cover off, and again, we're following the white wire here, and uh, that looks really good. I don't see any problems there. The wire gauge looks fine. And here on our neutral bar, that does, that does not look like there's a problem there. But let me mention something here. Look here, up this, this blue circuit, okay? We're feeding this 30 amp receptacle. The gauges of everything look fine. Here's our ground, everything looks fine. Um, but this, this blue circuit, I'm gonna call this the blue circuit. Doesn't this blue circuit daisy chain like we're in site 25? Didn't this one also feed site 24 and 23 and then 26 and 27? So, what they're supposed to do is alternate. So if this is a blue circuit, our neighbor should have, let's just say, a red tape. So they should alternate between two. Um, I, I don't know how this park is wired. I'd have to go up and look at all these others, but I don't want to disturb the people. But um, but this circuit here, it's, it's kind of like if I'm taking a shower and somebody turns on the sink, uh, my water pressure drops down. So there's some issues that might we might also need to consider here. And the way I would do that, if I really needed to dig deeper in this problem, is a data logger. I would put data loggers on my white, on my blue, and then I would put data loggers on the inside, and I would watch for amperage and voltage. And... Um, uh, if this problem uh, does do that, we might need to do that. I've got data loggers with me. I keep them stocked. But I would want to babysit this thing for maybe a week and just look at the the log trend over a week. So, But we're going to make sure that these screws are tight all around here. That's hot. We're going to have to do it hot. Again, do not do this yourself. There's no way to turn that off. I have insulated tools and flat arc flash um, equipment. But we're going to make sure that that's tight and that this is tight down here, okay? And then what we're gonna do is we're gonna do a lockout on this short cord right over here behind me. We're gonna basically put that on a lockout box so I can go work on the inside and um, work on his electricity, okay? So first we're just gonna make sure that that guy's tight right there and um, 35 inch pounds is about what we're shooting for right there, okay? Okay, so when I checked that service entrance outside, there was, uh, the, the wires were a little loose. They weren't terribly loose, but I was able to get at least a half turn on the white bus bar of that panel outside. Um, also on the receptacle itself, the 30 amp receptacle, each, the black, the ground, and the neutral, I was able to turn those a little bit. So there was uh, some resistance on the pedestal outside. So then we saw that the, the plug itself had a little bit of corrosion buildup on it. That brings us in here. Now, what we've done, um, we've made our wires, and like I said, close quarters, and um, and we're in here with flashlights because we have all the power off. So um, so these are the new wires. You see in, in there, um, we've got the junction boxes that we've placed on the ground. We've took, we've taken the old wires and we've cut off about a foot or so of the end because um, that wire was fatigued, it was melted. So we cut off and got back to some good wire. We put them in junction boxes and uh, we put that loom on top because if it's riding down the road, it, we don't want the wires to, to rub across the uh, junction box. So now we've got new wires. We made them nice and long. To feed this one of these comes from the generator one of them comes from shore power and this panel has an automatic transfer switch in it um now on this panel here's the carnage side but i want to show you something over on this side notice how this also the neutral chassis ground notice how this one has some some discoloration right here on that um 
board there. And when I started to take this apart, I want to see if I can get that shot right there. Look at that. Look at that arc on, on this one right here. Um, so that arc was touching. Let's see if I can get my camera um, on there. I need Dakota, hold that hold that back a little bit. There we go. Um, let's see here. So that was touching, or it, it has touched. Hold on. Flashlights here. Right in there. Okay. Now, here, hold that one back too. There we go. So there was some some something going on here with this panel. Um, another thing I wanted to show you was this wire here. Now, this is the DC side. Now, our problem was over here on the AC side. But on the DC side, this wire here was starting to melt also. Um, in there, we have a little bit of discoloration, but there's some melting going on on this, okay? And look, that was where uh, there was a little arc there, but this guy had a big arc. See that? All right, Dakota, let go of it for a second. And that is the battery plus side. But look here, the discoloration opposite um, this side. So there was something going on causing resistance. Now, I haven't checked to see if these are tight, but certainly this touching, ah, so tight in here. These touching was not healthy, okay? Um, so where we're at with this now, is we've got our new wires. We know that our box is going to fit. Um, we've taken all the wires out, made them longer. We found loose wires on the pedestal. Um, these neutral wires were loose. And these, I, I'm sorry, these were the ground wires on the old box. These ground wires were, I was, it, it didn't take much to take these screws apart. And uh, going, this was all melted. Um, so it's possible that this whole problem was caused from loose wires here on the neutral bus, okay? So follow with me, okay? These were where the breakers went. The breakers leave here, all happy, because these breakers, this is where the breakers go. There's the breaker bus bar. The breakers were, were happy. The wires connecting to the breakers were tight. It leaves, it goes out and does what it does, and it comes back on this. But look, this is a side that had the resistance on it. So this is a side here that was getting hot and it was getting so hot that, well, you see what happened. So we're going to keep going, but I wanted to kind of give you a, a, um, a snapshot on where we are. So again, this whole panel is going to be replaced. Now we're going to work on the DC side. We're going to take all these wires off, put them on the new. It's kind of like changing spark plugs on a vehicle. You just do one at a time is what I'm going to be doing on this. And um, that way the circuits stay the same. Okay, so that's where we are right now. Um, close quarters. New wires, new panel, loose connection so far seems to be the problem with this. But I did want to mention that arcing that we saw on this side as well. So uh, that's where we got. So we're in the dark with flashlights because we got all the power off. And um, once we get the panel back in, we'll come back and talk with you again. Okay, folks, I just wanted to jump in. I'm, I'm at the point where I'm taking these wires off. This was a guy that was really, really hot. And this was battery plus and battery minus here. These wires were so loose. I'm, I mean, it was so easy to um to turn these screws to pull the wires out so again we need to make sure that i want what i want you to do after watching this video is go out to your rv and just tighten every screw you see in your electrical panel okay um you can get a torquing screwdriver i've got a whole other video on preventative maintenance and i talk about my torquing screwdriver that's what we'll be using when we're doing this um i haven't looked but somewhere on this panel down here it might tell us what the torque is supposed to be on these um but uh yeah, these were so, so, so loose. And, okay, so maybe it leaves a factory to spec, but now you're going to go through summer and winter and voter vibrations. These need to be tightened constantly. So I'm going to say that one of the reasons that this panel fried was because these connections got loose from heat and cold and expansion, contraction, all that kind of stuff. Like I said, the guy that was the one melty, this was a very loose connection. And you can even see, well... I'm looking there. You can see how he got mushed in, but over time, his mushiness became uh, loose. So anyway, just wanted to show you that. We're going to get back to work now. Okay, now earlier in our video, we talked about the wire size and how the fuses protect the wire. And look right down here on the bottom of this panel. It says that the torque should be 14 inch pounds of torque for these screws. Now I can go ahead and tell you that these screws were very loose. Um, 
certainly not 14 inch pounds. Um, and that I should have a 12 to a 16 gauge wire and 14 inch pounds of torque on these wires here under these screws. So everything is to spec. And so, like I said, um, make sure that, let's see if this tells us, uh, okay, here, look at this one. Uh, battery terminals are two to 14 gauge, torque to 40 inch pounds. Okay, so these panels tell you on them what the inch pounds are supposed to be. Um, Dakota, hand me a breaker. Let me see a breaker. Okay, so we've got a breaker here and we're talking about torque. I've got a, a two 15 amps and up here we've got a, uh, it says 15 amp, um, a four to eight gauge wire. If you go down here, it wants 25 inch pounds of torque. Okay, if you're running a, a 40 amp breaker, a 40 to a 50 amp breaker, then you need 35 inch pounds of torque. So a 15 to a 30 amp breaker gets 25 inch pounds and a 40 to a 50 amp breaker gets 35 inch pounds, okay? Um, so everything's got torque values. Everything's got torque ratings. Um, this one's 14 inch, foot, inch pounds, that's 40 inch pounds. And I'm telling you right now, folks, these wires here were not 40 inch pounds. 40 inch pounds takes two hands to turn that screwdriver. And there's no way that these were at 40 inch pounds. So, um, once we get the new panel over here, we'll read how, what the torque is supposed to be on the neutral. I think it's about um, 35 inch pounds on neutral, uh, but we'll verify. So at the end of the day, we're melting things because we did not have the proper torque. Okay, so we're you've watched this video this long. That's what it's looking like. All these screws are loose. So again, homework assignment, go check yours. Okay, we got light back in the room, and that is because uh, we've got all of our DC reconnected. We've got all our fuses where they go. Um, this panel, the, the I'm, I'm holding it. So the red and the white came in at different angles. So we had to lengthen those wires. That was kind of a trick. And now on this side, on the AC side, uh, like that. You see, I've got my wires pulled through. One of the little um, craft uh, trade crafts that you might see as use a paint pin on the wires there. Okay, I don't know if you can see them all, but every every black wire has a paint code on it. And even, even back here, you can see some of the, the, the paint dots that I would use. And the reason I do that is to match up the circuit. So it's it's the same circuit. I don't have to go hunting around trying to figure out um, what which one's the air conditioner, which one's the receptacle. So I just color the match the colors. Uh, they say Marines like to use our crayons. So uh, <laughs> here's my, my color code everything. So um, we've got the DC done. We've got the wires lengthened. We've fed them through. We've got our strain relief on the back. Now they're fed through nice and long, brand new wires. And what we're gonna do now is we're gonna put this box into the hole and then we're gonna button all this up and um, we're gonna look and see what the torque rating is supposed to be on these things and get everybody torqued up so we don't have this problem again. So that's the next step. We've got the new panel buttoned up against the wall. DC side's done. We got all of our Romex wires sticking out. Now the question is, how tight do you tighten the screws? Which is what started this whole problem in the first place. This is this cover that goes on over the breakers there. And if you look, okay. If you look, here, let me just set it down. Let's look at this together. Um, right in here, it's gonna say that the line terminal is 35 inch pounds of torque. The neutral, 35 inch pounds of torque and the ground we have a 10 gauge ground so he's 35 inch pounds of torque okay that's how tight these are supposed to be now i have a like again i went through my torquing screwdriver on another video on preventative maintenance and you you rotate this and this window tells you the the um the torque value i've got it already set to 35 and so i'll just take that bit and put in the right bit here and twist it and then the screwdriver will kind of snap a little bit um now, another thing I noticed is on this panel over on this side, they talk about the different uh, manufactured, you know, Siemens, Square D, blah, blah, blah. And they talk about the different torque rating on, on here. So I might make those 36 inch pounds also, even though on the breaker itself, it has its rating. Um, this panel wants everything to be 35, 36 inch pounds of torque. And so again, your homework assignment, go check yours. So you don't have this problem on your end. Okay. So... What we're going to do is button all this up. Now, what I do is I always, 
I've been doing this for years and years. It's been my career is, is electrical stuff. I always start with the ground conductors first, ground being the most important conductor of all the conductors, because if something goes south or goes sideways, it's the ground that's going to save the day. So I want to make sure that all my ground circuits are connected first, that they're perfect. That there's there, I can't do anything more to make the ground any better than it is. Then I'm going to do my neutrals, and then I'm going to do my my the black wires to the breakers. Okay, so I'm going to do ground, neutral, black, all 35 inch pounds. Okay. Okay, so folks, so here's how a torquing screwdriver works. I use my impact drill to tighten all these screws. So now I'm going to 35 inch pounds. So look, as tight as that impact did, it didn't do it tight enough. Now listen for the snap. It's still turning. There you go. So that little snap was 35 inch pounds. So my impact drill, that drill, it was not able to get it to 35 inch pounds. Look at that, I'm gonna, that's a half a turn. Another, that's three quarters of a turn. Three quarters of a turn tighter than my impact screwdriver. And uh, there we go. So that's that's what we're doing. We're getting, a, look at that, look how loose that one was. There we go. Um, this one was really loose. There we go. So now we know that these are all 35 inch pounds. I'm gonna do my neutrals and then I'll finish up with my grounds. Where we're at at this point right now is I've got all of my, you saw how we got these at 35 inch pounds. These are all at 35 inch pounds and even these underneath here. So everything's buttoned up. We've checked to make sure that all these torque, everything's torqued correctly. So now we're gonna go clean the prongs on the end of that plug, plug it back into the receptacle, the pedestal, and plug it in and we're gonna come in here and check everything, okay? That's the next step. Well, folks, we're at the end of the journey. Um, if you stayed with me this whole video, you're probably pretty tired of watching me. Um, I know it went kind of long, but I wanted to get a lot of electrical stuff out front in the beginning so that when I say, hey, it was a loose connection, it's a loose wire, that you would understand a little bit more about resistance, induction, um, hertz, AC, DC, volts, amps. And I wanted to kind of cover a large area of, of things so that if you're troubleshooting your RV, um, it, it I wanted to add value to how you look at these electrical problems. Uh, so in this instance, we had a, a, um, a melted neutral. And as we were digging in farther and farther into the problem, what we found was there were some loose connections on the neutral. So remember I said there was three things that I could think of. If I thought, I could probably think of some more, but there's three things I could think of that would cause uh, the neutral to melt. One was resistance, two was wire gauge, and three was a shared neutral between two hots. And in this instance, what we found was the neutral wire, we found a lot of loose wires. Um, we found them in the pedestal, we found them in the panel. Um, so if this has been helpful, please thumb it up. That really does help us. Just give us a thumb up on it. Make a comment down below if you have a question for me or if you wanna correct something that I said or something's not clear, make a comment. Um, if you like our videos, you could subscribe to them. And when a new video comes out, you can get the latest, greatest video. And uh, so this is Darren. I have one more thing to say. Happy camper, same I RV works. Yay. Hey. Okay. Awesome job. <laughs>